So how many of you were at the first Green Jobs Conference in Pittsburgh about five years ago? Um, I remember sitting in that room, and it's so exciting to see how this movement has grown, right? Um, back in those days, it was before the stimulus package was passed, including $500 million for green job training. Proud to say that Philadelphia received more of those dollars than any other city in the country. Yes, we're very proud of that. Um, and the climate really has changed, so I'm proud to be with you today. I've attended all of the conferences. I remember in 2000 and eight, actually, um, 2009, standing with a delegation of labor and workforce leaders from Pennsylvania, business leaders from Philadelphia, talking to our senators right before the Recovery Act vote was passed, um, advocating for the inclusion of green jobs training dollars. So it's so exciting to see how far that's come. Um, and I'm pleased to welcome the panel here today as well. We've got some really distinguished experts to share their, their voices with you. I'm going to ask each panelist to make a very brief introduction. And so my job as moderator today is to keep us on track, to make sure that one, no one voice dominates, and that we're able to move through a real discussion, because our audience really does want to hear our opinions about sustainable communities and a clean energy plan for the 21st century. Um, so brief, I'm going to ask you to give your elevator pitch. Um, so you've got one minute to introduce yourself, and then we'll go right into questions. Ed. I'm Ed Murphy. I'm the director of the Workforce Development Institute, which is a nonprofit partner of the New York State AFL-CIO. We do education, training, economic development. We give out childcare money. Uh, we found, founded and fund the New York State Apollo Alliance. We put together a solar jobs coalition. We have a green tradesman card. Uh, program that we train the building trades to work with uh, uh, under US GBC standards. And I'd like to close with more symbolic language. Uh, one of the things we do is culture and we do photography. Uh, the question I would have is for, for the audience, how many of the women here are Girl Scouts growing up? How many people in the last month or so bought Girl Scout cookies? Okay. A hundred years ago, the Girl Scouts were founded. And you know, if you bought the cookies, you see that. But there was something else that happened 100 years ago. In Lawrence, Massachusetts, a group of women and girls walked out the door of a mill. And when they were asked, what did they want? They said, bread and roses. They wanted to be treated as human beings. <laughs> WDI has put together a program around this. We put together this poster. And uh, I'd like this be, to be the symbolic language of who we are we remember where we come from. We remember the women that went out on that strike. And when they asked for bread and roses, today we ask for jobs and a clean environment. <laughs> the, these posters are out front at the registration desk. I would ask you to pick them up, post them up, help people remember that we stand on the shoulders of giants. Great, thanks, Don. Hi. I'm Don Lewis, president of SCA Americas, uh, part of SCA Globally. We're a $16.5 billion hygiene company. Uh, we have products in over 100 countries globally. In North America specifically, uh, one of our large businesses is the professional hygiene business, which is towel tissue and napkin products sold on the away from home arena. You've probably seen our ExpressNap products if you've gone to a lot of venues uh, in an innovative dispenser system. But the, the key to the products we make is they're 100% recycled. We've just, in the last decade, we've just recycled our 12 billionth pound of waste paper and make great uh, towel tissue and napkin products. So uh, we're very proud of our relationship with the United Steel Workers, and uh, together we, we have a very sustainable business. Kevin. As you know, I'm Kevin Knobloch, the president of the Union of Concerned Scientists, and uh, we are a national organization of scientists and non-scientists, but non-scientists who support the mission of ensuring that science is informing uh, public policy. And in the context of this discussion, we uh, not only have scientists and technical pe people who understand the body of climate science, what's happening in terms of climate change, but also what we can do about it, the solution set. So we have a lot of deep uh, engineering and, and other knowledge around renewable energy, energy efficiency, uh, uh, advanced vehicle technology, uh, uh, sustainable forestry, and the like, uh, and really having hard at work trying to uh, do, 
build the roadmap to how we can actually reduce greenhouse gas emissions on the scale that we really must. Great. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Foley. Good afternoon. My name is uh, Hank Foley. I'm very pleased to be here. I'm representing two organizations, uh, both Penn State University, which is a 150-year-old land-grant university dedicated to education, research, and outreach for the state, the region, and the nation. I'm also um, the director and principal investigator for something called the Greater Philadelphia Innovation Cluster. And I believe that's probably why I'm on this panel today. It's a, uh, a DOE hub, and uh, it's one of three that have been uh, awarded so far in the country. One to Caltech, one to Oak Ridge National Labs, one to Penn State and a consortium of other schools and, and corporations. And we're loaded, located here in Philadelphia at the Navy Yard. Our goal is the same goal that we heard Nancy speak of. Namely, that is to look at the building sector and essentially to revolutionize it. Our goal is to cut 20% of the energy that is wasted in buildings like this by 2020. That's the nation's goal, that's our goal. We have to do it with people, we have to do it with information, and we have to do it with technology. No one of those is the solution. We need all three of them. I'll elaborate more if I get a chance, but I'm also uh, the son of a 92-year-old uh, union organizer and union member. So there you go. <laughs> I'm Judy. Hi, I'm Judith Hank. I'm a regional administrator for US EPA. I work for Lisa Jackson. The way EPA is set up, there are 10 different regions. I have the best region because it's um, New York, New Jersey, uh, the eight Indian nations in New York, Puerto Rico, and the US Virgin Islands. Uh, before coming to EPA, I worked for 10 years in the New York Governor's Office and the New York Attorney General's Office. And before that, I was an environmental organizer uh, with NYPIRG and also environmental advocates. And before I get into my very serious remarks, I want to say that I feel like I'm on the set of Oprah. And um, <laughs> I want to announce under your seats, you'll find maybe you get a hybrid, you get a compost bin, you get a low flow toilet. and. Um, and I think we should go to Oprah with that theme, a little environmental green product. <laughs> Thank you, panelists. And so I'm going to go right into questions. Um, there's lots of things that we could cover today, but I'm going to start with one of the first things that I'm always asked. Everybody's talking about green jobs. I'm often asked to define what a green job is, what kind of jobs are we talking about, sometimes from folks who want to play devil's advocate, do these jobs really exist? Um, and so two weeks ago, the Federal Bureau of Labor Statistics released the most complete picture to date of the country's green workforce. Pennsylvania came out on top, number five. With more than 100,000 green jobs. So I'm gonna put this to you. Why do you think Pennsylvania is a leader in the green economy? Why are we coming out on top? Um, and whoever would like to can start. Sure, I, I think we've had terrific leadership over the last uh, eight to 10 years. Uh, I think the, uh, uh, the governor of uh, Pennsylvania and previous administration was very devoted and dedicated to this. I think here in Philadelphia, Mayor Nutter has just been outstanding. I think one of the reasons we were able to procure uh, the DOE hub and bring it to Philadelphia is because of the kinds of things that he had been saying about making uh, Philadelphia a very green city. Uh, I think on the other side of the state, they're seeking to do the same thing. So I think we've had good leadership and I think we have uh, a base of educated people who get it mm -hmm. and who are trying to make it happen. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? I know you don't all represent Pennsylvania, but other opinions on this? Well, I, I would just jump in and, and say, in, 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 I'm not fam as familiar with Pennsylvania and Philadelphia, but in terms of the question of what is a green job, mm -hmm. the, the, the obvious part of the answer are you know, those people who are, who are fabricating wind turbines and wind towers, installing them, maintaining them, and all of that. I, I think it's much broader. I think it's the folks who work at General Electric or Maytag who are building the most efficient washers, dryers, dishwashers, heating, cooling systems. Uh, and, and, and it's also striking that, that there are a lot of jobs that you wouldn't necessarily think of as a green job, but in fact 
if they're involved in this transition to a clean energy economy, pouring concrete, driving a truck, bending metal, those are green jobs too. And I think the, more, the, the broader definition we take, I think that we're not only going to be more accurate, but over time it won't be an anomaly. It will shift to being the majority of the workforce. I know that um, for the last few years, the focus has been mostly on renewable energy, energy efficiency, which is essential. But I also want to invite us to sort of broaden our understanding of green jobs. For instance, I think EPA is one of the real drivers in terms of creating uh, green jobs. Um, you know, 30 years ago, uh, Congress established Superfund uh, to clean up abandoned toxic waste sites. Now, of course, we'd rather not have these toxic waste sites. We'd rather have an investment in pollution prevention, green chemistry, but unfortunately, they are there. So um, in my own EPA region, we've identified, just in New York and New Jersey, about 4,200 jobs were, were created uh, cleaning up toxic waste sites. Uh, my beloved Hudson River uh, in New York, which has been so devastated by um, PCB pollution, uh, we finally have gotten going on dredging, uh, don't worry, it's working out great. And that was uh, 500 new jobs just from cleaning up one contaminated river. So I think we want to sort of go back, look at the Superfund program, look at funding for water infrastructure. All of our cities have drinking water systems, wastewater systems that are failing. Repairing them will create jobs. In fact, in just New York and New Jersey, uh, we created 13,200 jobs dispersing EPA funds for water upgrades, including uh, President Obama's Recovery Act funding. Um, you look at the mercury pollution uh, power plant rule. Uh, I loved Ed's um, poster, and I, I'll remember that image. I guess my image is I had come with a stack of federal regulations, um, <laughs> and those regulations not only protect public health and the environment, but they create jobs. In December, uh, Administrator Lisa Jackson uh, announced the uh, mercury pollution standards from power plants, which I find amazing. Mercury from power plants was largely unregulated until this regulation came forward, except in some indiv individual states that have taken action. Implementing this one mercury regulation creates 46,000 short-term jobs, 8,000 long-term jobs, mostly in the utility sector. So I think, uh, to quote one of my colleagues at EPA, EPA is a uh, mean, green gob job creation machine <laughs> and um, is, is actually helping create local jobs where we need them most. If I could add yes, just a bit. Uh, we've done a baseline report here in the greater Philadelphia region, which is the, uh, the 10 county region. And we've looked at those buildings that we think are optimally sort of place to do a retrofit on. And a retrofit means going in and figuring out what you could change in lighting, insulation, building envelope, uh, plug loads, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, and so forth, and, and doing it better and reducing the energy use of these buildings. We estimate that there could be uh, as many buildings as would take $618 million to actually retrofit. So I didn't say that quite right, but if you figured a million dollars per retrofit, there are probably 600 to 700 buildings already that could be done. Right? And that's, again, good jobs for people. These are jobs that really mean something. We think it could be as many as 23,000 jobs that could be taken up in retrofitting these buildings. Mm -hmm. Someone said that um, you know, energy saved is energy uh, not wasted and therefore pollution not generated. So think about it. The United States uses 100 quadrillion uh, quads, that is, of BTUs a year in energy. It's an enormous number. 40% of that is used in buildings, and well over half of that literally goes out the window, up the stack, just gone, because we don't build the buildings efficiently and we don't operate them properly. So that's our goal. Our goal is to really get in there, understand that, and start to produce jobs and make this economy around uh, retrofitting work out, this market, if you will, work out. Other examples of how your work is creating green jobs? Well, <clears throat> to address the essence of your question, I have to move beyond Pennsylvania to New York, which is also in the Brookings uh, report, mm -hmm. very high up there. And I think it's, uh, you know, to, beyond Judith, it's thought leaders. I think having good thought leaders 
and people who are willing to talk to people that you disagree with. And the ability of the unions and business and the environmentalists to come together as coalitions who are willing to work together and find a sense of what you can do together. And so it's the thought leaders, it's the having good organizers, which I think we have to come back to again and again, and then people having the muscle to implement some of that, not just to say it's a good idea, but to, to go to the legislature, go to the businesses, and find a way that they can be satisfied as well as we can be satisfied in that dialogue. I, I have a comment as well in our industry. We find that as customer demand increases for green products, it's actually given us a competitive advantage. And in a marketplace that's been flat or growing slightly, we've been able to grow several times faster than the marketplace, employing more green jobs along the way. Also being a uh, company that uses recycled fiber, we found, especially when we started our plant in Alabama, we were adding a second paper machine, and we found that we really couldn't get the waste paper. A lot of it's being exported to China. And so uh, with Atlanta being one of our major markets to collect recycling, we were able to partner with local recyclers and actually give them equipment to build up their businesses, which increased the uh, amount of recycled fiber coming from the commercial building in Atlanta, buildings in Atlanta from 15% to 60% recovery. So it's not only our own jobs, but it's that ripple effect that we've all spoken of that creates more and more jobs as it gets extended. So let me understand this. SCA needed more product, more recycled content to be mm -hmm. able to grow your line of products and you were able to actually invest in the local recycling industry to help keep some of that here. We and did. Lots of times they were under underfunded or uh -huh. others were committed to China. So uh, we made that investment in small businesses which allowed them, allowed them to grow and, and flourish and at the same time uh, allowed us to have that waste paper stream we needed to make our product. So it's not just the jobs that you correct created directly, but the jobs that you're also going to create indirectly. And can you talk about the kind of green jobs that are being created within SCA? Uh, in all areas of our, our, our company, uh, green jobs are being created. We're really looking at getting more expertise and um, more green technology into our business. Uh, we've we've um, used the conventional green um, additions to our facilities using the photo um, solar cells and um, you know adding wind turbines to our facility in Wisconsin. And when we dedicated, the uh, union representative said when I was speaking of sustainability, I was using it in the conventional sense, but he was explaining how sustainability meant sustainability in jobs. Mm -hmm. So as, as our business continues to grow, rather it be the hourly workforce, salary workforce, uh, engineers, uh, people in technology, they've all grown. So we've added several hundreds of jobs in different marketplaces over the last five years. At the Sustainable Business Network, we define sustainability as triple bottom line, so looking not just at the environmental impact, but the social impact. Correct. So having good jobs created that are also having a positive environmental benefit. Absolutely, that like with what good corporate doing. social responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, so let's shift gears and talk about policy. We heard from Chair Sutley some of the things that the administration has already put in place that would drive policy around green job creation. I would like each of you to respond to the question of what policy would you like to see today that you think could really be a driver around green jobs and sustainable communities? Um, and whoever wants to take that first. Kevin, I'm thinking you probably. Uh, sure. We, uh, a big, big part of our focus in terms of pu setting public policy in place has been to establish performance standards. Mm -hmm. That is not to pick technological winners or losers, but figure out what the science says mm -hmm. needs to be our standard. Um, and so, for example, the, the renewable electricity standard. Um, this was the, the concept where you require power generators in a particular jurisdiction to, by increasing percentages of new renewable energy. Started in California in the late 90s. Today, there are 30 states that have renewable electricity standards, including here in Pennsylvania. Uh, each one of those st states set their own percentage. A lot of them have increased the percentage over time. Uh, California now has the most advanced forward-leaning one at 33 uh, percent by, I believe, 2020. Um, but here's the cool thing. Uh, in any one of those states, we're not saying it's got to be wind or it's got to be a geo geothermal. Each state can play to their strengths. And look at what's happening to the solar industry, the geothermal industry, the wind power industry. Solar uh, today has uh, about 108,000 direct jobs. That is a doubling in three years of those jobs. Uh, wind power has about 75,000 jobs, and DOE projects that between now and 2030, it's going to increase fivefold for half a million direct jobs uh, in those industries. 
But some other interesting things are happening too. In the wind industry, a majority, 60% of those turbines and towers and blades that are installed in this country are now manufactured here, more than doubling of what it was less than five years ago. In, in the solar sector, we're a net exporter of those panels. So those economies are just, th those, those sectors are just exploding, double-digit growth, uh, and it has a direct result because of forward thinking, setting concrete goals with these renewable policies. The, the fuel economy standards we were talking about earlier, um, our analysis projects uh, will um, uh, lead to a, a creation of 300,000 new jobs when fully implemented. Now, uh, probably about, uh, about 30,000 of those are directly in auto manufacturing. The other jobs come, this is the spin-off effect, come from the money that we and businesses save at the pump. That money today is, much of that is going out of state and out of country. What happens when you pay half as much to fill up your tank? You take that money and you, you might save it, you might pay off your credit card bills, but most likely you're going to recycle it more locally. That spin-off effect creates jobs. So, it, so you, I, I didn't answer your question, which is what policy going forward. But I what's think at I, the top of your list right now? A, a national clean energy standard, which the president has called for. Mm -hmm. uh, 30 states have, have set, showed, showed the way forward. They're very successful. Uh, they're, they're not only uh, uh, creating uh, business opportunities, creating wealth, jobs, they're expanding the tax base in each of those states um, and pushing technology. So a national standard would really uh, double down. Let me ask you to go one step further. What will it take for us to get a national clean energy standard? To light a fire under the U.S. Congress. Uh, you know, the president uh, did not make some in the environmental community happy when he proposed his national clean energy standard because he included nuclear energy in, in it. He included uh, natural gas in it. He included clean coal. Um, but uh, it wasn't lost on us that he set the, the goal so ambitiously mm -hmm. that there's room for a very robust growth in terms of efficiency and renewables in addition to. We were worried, particularly because of the cost of nuclear power, that that would kind of hog uh, a lot of the resources mm -hmm. if it were included under the umbrella, but I think it's been skillfully crafted, mm -hmm. whatever you think of those other options. But where he's going with that, of course, is trying to build a political coalition. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's not renewables and efficiency against uh, conventional mm -hmm. uh, energy, but rather there's, there's room at the table for mm -hmm. some of these other bridge technologies and bridge fuels. Um, so uh, the politics are there if, if we make them work, if we go out and help members of Congress understand uh, this is going to help their, their state, their districts. Dr. Foley, GPIC is working on energy efficiency. What's your number yeah. one from a policy perspective? Well, well, let me just say first that we have a whole task. That is, we have five tasks. One of those is related to policy, regulations, human behavior. And we think that it's exceptionally important that we try to understand where those policies are that either get in the way or that could be put in place that would allow us to really accelerate and take this business off and really put people back to work retrofitting buildings. That said, I mentioned that we're, really folk, we're at the nexus of issues of people, information, and technology. Uh, that means social, political issues when I say people, obviously, as well as information and technology. But one of the key things we're lacking is information and information sharing. So for right now, if I wanted to have the information on this building, uh, it would be very hard for me to get that. It's even hard to get it released. So there are all sorts of policies and regulations that are between us and doing things like smart metering, uh, t attaching things to the grid. So we just had a meeting, was it about two weeks ago, uh, with all the public utility commissioners in the regional, in the mid-Atlantic region, asking them if they couldn't start to come together around this theme of opening up and having more sharing of information. So that would be a policy change. It would be a, a pretty dramatic one. And if we had that information, then as engineers, we could go to work faster, better, and, and more effectively. But let me tell you the flip side of it. So as this is happening, someone else has come along and said, you know, we need a policy against you guys. We gotta have a law that protects the individual citizen from invasion of their, from invasion of their privacy. So there's also, you know, these sort of cross-cutting things that happen mm -hmm. that say, gee, you know, we, we just definitely don't need that kind of lawmaking. What we, what we do need, though, 
is uh, more liberalization of policies. Uh, we can find ways to anonymize information, but we've got to get a lot more information out to everybody and stop having the utilities and others hold that as proprietary to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and that's a big, big change. It's a cultural change as much as a policy change. Mm -hmm. But I think we can do it. If you demand it, it'll happen. Ed? I want to follow up on what you're saying about information. <coughs> um, if anybody looked at my, uh, my bio, I began my professional life in the intelligence business. Uh, <coughs> I think information is essential. But what we really need is a policy that's integrated with programs, budget, and personnel. You can't just have policies. You've got to have the ability to implement them, to enforce them, and you have to have the resources to, uh, to do that, and you have to have the people who know how to do that. So my, top on my priority is a workforce impact analysis. Unless you really understand, as you do with environmental impact, that when we introduced environmental impact, we changed the game because people had to define what the environmental consequences are of what they did. We need to balance that and integrate that with workforce impact. So, for example, the MTA in about 2001 put out a billion dollar RFP. M and MTA, so and silly oh, audience. Sorry, the, the <laughs> Metropolitan Transportation Authority yeah. in New York, which is the largest transit system in the country. Mm -hmm. They put out a billion dollar uh, RFP uh, to, to buy railroad cars, and Kawasaki, a company, got that bid. They wound up laying off their people because they said they didn't have the skills. But if the MTA or any transit authority or any company building or government is building, it says part of the RFP, you have to have a workforce impact analysis. You decide what the jobs are that have to be done, what the skills are that have to be done, like you do, what the environmental consequences are. And then the Workforce Investment Act monies and the educational monies, the community colleges, the high schools can all mobilize those skills and we can begin to say that green jobs are really, really important, and we want that training at the fourth grade math level, as we did with the ship fab plant up in, mm -hmm. up in Malta, New York. Mm -hmm. they, they came and brought billions of dollars because they said well, the math scores have to be high. You have to have that information to do that. Mm -hmm. And if it's a requirement in the RFP, then everybody, it's a level playing ground. Everybody has to say it, and then we can mobilize the unions the businesses can mobilize, the educational institutions can mobilize. That information changes the game, mm -hmm. the way environmental impact did. And that would be my harsh priority. Dr. Foley, can you talk? I know that there's some real work happening at GPIC with the sustainability workshop. I know those folks are in the house. Can you talk about how GPIC is doing this? Sure. Uh, we have a whole task force really working on policies, as I said, but also education and workforce. That's one of the crucial things, as Mr. Murphy was just saying, is, is really um, educating from not just PhDs, but from GEDs to PhDs. Really, uh, the whole supply chain, if you will, uh, from those people working in the trades who need more information. Mm -hmm. We're putting on workshops for them, teaching them how to do these things. We're working uh, together with a number of area uh, trade schools and also community colleges to put together what we're calling a competency-based career mapping. Right? So what we'd like to do is really lay out for folks what they need to know, create a curriculum around it, and then export it, give it away, get as many people going on it as we possibly can. Because as we do that, I think we'll also see, I mean, the construction industry is a really entrepreneurial group of people. Mm -hmm. They're all entrepreneurs. If we could get the information to them and cut down on this asymmetry, then I think we could really see a tremendous uplift uh, in, this, in this particular mm -hmm. field of, of building efficiency. But as I said, Building efficiency is important because we waste so much energy here. Mm -hmm. I'll give you one more number that I love, and that is every time you, have, you waste a quad of energy, what you've wasted is something on the order of $30 million. Right? So you just let it go out the window. Uh, if you save 10 quads, that's $300 million. Well, that's $300 million that could be reinvested into the economy to do more productive things than to simply let it go out the roof and out the windows and so forth. So I think working on all of these strategies and trying to try to really educate, a huge component of what we do in GPIC is education and information sharing and substituting good, clean information for misinformation. This is a tremendous amount of misinformation. Someone alluded to that, uh, which built skepticism towards green jobs, green energy, efficiency, and so forth. So another part of what we have to do, 
So we have to dispel the skepticism uh, by actually demonstrating that these technologies do work, showing the economics work out, show people that the payback is there, and then bring that to the table and dispel the information that's saying, ah, it'll never work. So Don, I want to bring the policy question back to you. From a business perspective, what kind of policy drivers would help grow green jobs in your industry? Uh, two things in particular. From a tactical level, I think the, the uh, fiber sourcing is important. I know the Blue Green Alliance has done good work from supporting the businesses from that aspect. Mm -hmm. From a broader sense, you know, certainly appreciating agencies like the EPA and, and raising the bar uh, actually you know, makes us better and can give those that are really behind it a competitive advantage. Mm -hmm. With that being said, uh, lots of times that costs more money, uh, majority of the time. Although there's a payback, sometimes it's very long. And, and if you're making a truly financial decision, sometimes doing the right thing doesn't make the best financial sense. So I think economic support is probably the key to that. And uh, as, as my uh, fellow panelists mentioned, it's not just in the, the, the typical green jobs, but it's in the light and heavy manufacturing end of the business. And we've worked with um, New York State with the Research and Development Agency on getting some funding and some training and creating an awareness, which has really been beneficial. So I think the more government can invest from economic development, that's the best thing that could help our mm -hmm. business. Great. Judy, you're on the other side of this coin, right? Well, Policy I, driver. Yeah, I mean, I've got like a million answers to your question, so let me focus on one. Um, don't forget the public health benefits. Um, have it, how many of you, um, <laughs> How many of you have a fishing license in Pennsylvania? So have you read that license lately in terms of what you're not allowed to consume because of mercury pollution or PCB pollution? Um, I love the part of the fishing license that says if you're um, uh, pregnant or of childbearing age, consume num none. Like that's a big part of our population who's never going to be able to consume uh, freshwater fish in this country. So. I think making the connection between, for instance, the mercury regulations that EPA just came out with and the tragedy of our fresh water being so contaminated that fish are not safe to consume. And we also know that lots of low-income families do consume fish. It's a protein source. It's, it's free. What do we do to make that connection? This is very much an environmental justice issue. It's a social justice issue. So I think across the board, if it's recycling, which I applaud what your company is doing, um, if it's energy efficiency, if it's renewables, you know, on efficiency, preventing massive amounts of soot coming out of power plants is a public health issue. So just as um, unions have been extraordinarily effective in making uh, making sure people are not exposed to toxins in an occupational se setting, I think green jobs has enormous public health benefits that need to be emphasized more. Great. Um, so one of the things that we've seen here in Philadelphia is that we had this tremendous influx of federal dollars for green jobs training, but in order to get people actually into good jobs at the end of the training programs, we needed to have a market for their services. Um, and so there's been a challenge, I think, across the country, matching the supply and the demand. Um, so what are your thoughts on what it would take to build the market for a sustainable economy so that folks who've been trained, who are ready to go to, the wor to work, um, union workers, can actually get jobs? So yes. let me just jump in, and then I promise to stop talking. Um, so, you know, job training is always tricky because you train people, and then where are the jobs? So, um, one of my colleagues, Shanine Mitchell from EPA, is here. She's going to talk tomorrow about Brownfield's job training, and I want to share a recent experience we had in Newark, New Jersey. Um, unfortunately, the Passaic River is heavily contaminated. Uh, it makes the Hudson look like a birdbath in terms of um, contamination. And um, we have a super fun cleanup going on there. Um, and we have a super fun job training initiative. And what's different about this program is rather than just training people, we talk to the companies in advance. If people go through this training, will you hire these folks at the end? And thankfully, some of the companies involved in cleaning up the Passaic River said yes, and they were very enthusiastic. So we put out the word in Newark, New Jersey, very informally through churches and faith networks, labor unions, community-based groups. This was very much led by the Ironbound Community Corporation. We put out the word that we want to do Superfund job training. 
we had 500 applicants for 15 slots. And these 15 really inspiring low-income unemployed workers went through the job training. It was three weeks. I was really um, pleased to speak at their graduation. They're now all employed. Well, 14 out of 15 were hired. And, and this is a pathway out of poverty. You start with the Superfund job training, and then you can get other job training. It's really important when you're doing Superfund cleanups and brownfield cleanups that you're not exposed to toxins. Mm -hmm. So the training is really important. So I would just encourage the job training push. You've got to think about where you're going to place people yeah. in advance. And it works when you do that. Right. And the businesses need to be at the table. Oh, yeah. We had a... We had a couple really nice conversations with the businesses, and they really stepped up. And um, if you don't have that conversation first, it's it's futile almost. Dr. Foley. Yeah, I was, I was going to add that you mentioned the 15 out of 500, and that's great. I always feel like I would have been one of the 485 that didn't get the the call, you know. So I want to put the other 485 to work, and and that's really I think in this construction area, mm -hmm. construction sector is a trillion dollars a year. It's enormous. People don't realize how large it is. So if we could start to demonstrate the technologies, educate people, turn them loose, work with them on business plans, and make that cycle complete over the next five years, I think the thing takes off. And at least some of those other 485 are going to get jobs. Some are going to be bending metal, swinging hammers, shoveling things, but, but that's the point is that it's a ground up kind of approach uh, to just creating a marketplace uh, for these technologies and for saving energy. So, Kevin. Well, I, I would really applaud uh, what both of the previous speakers have said, and, and Judith, the, the proactive linking of employers and trainees is, is brilliant. I think we're seeing at the community college level across this country mm -hmm. a real proactive yeah. effort to be yeah. talking to companies directly mm -hmm. and then there are great examples where a community college will build an entire, um, you know, major focus mm -hmm. because right. there's a company in the area that needs so many yeah. uh, machinists or, or what, what have you. But the other point I wanted to make is what, what can we do to sort of uh, create this market mm -hmm. for these, these folks who are coming out of the training programs? As consumers, we are enormously powerful. So mm -hmm. whether we're, we're thinking about you know, hygiene products, or uh, the kind of car we, we purchase, or the kind of appliance we purchase. By, by choosing the more uh, environmentally friendly option, that is creating jobs. That's driving business to companies, allows them to, to grow, and create these new slots. And it's extremely powerful. So I just wanted to give a, a, a little nod to, in May, we're coming out with a new book. Uh, it's a consumer's guide for smart climate choices. It's called Cooler Smarter. And it, it calls on all of us to commit to reducing our own greenhouse gas emissions by 20% in the near term. And each chapter, it just dissects our lives from a, you know, an mm -hmm. analytical perspective, from transportation, food we purchase, mm -hmm. and how we, how we eat, to the stuff we buy, you know, all of our electronics. It's really cool. It just, it just dissects every facet of our lives and gives guidance as to how you can reduce your, your environmental impact and your, and your global warming pollute, pollution. And I'm very excited about it because I think if we can really whip that up into a national campaign, that, that almost more, almost more than any policy you can invent mm -hmm. will drive economic investment in this country in a big way to these green jobs. Um, so Don, from a business perspective, it sounds like the market for your green product has grown. What was the cause of that? Well, it's certainly awareness. It's customer awareness. And uh, from some of the polling that we've done, customers still want to make green decisions. They don't necessarily want to pay more, but they want to make green decisions. And, and, and we really, uh, we work with our customers to actually show them the benefit of making green decisions. The Philadelphia Eagles were mentioned earlier, and they've been a customer of ours for about five years now. And when they were putting their Go Green campaign together, uh, we sat down for four hours and, and said, you know, how could we work together to make this happen? So not only do they utilize our products, but they also uh, have uh, anecdotes showing, uh, you know, the equivalent of waste paper saved that day by using napkins is the equivalent to so many offensive linemen, or the amount of water saved is, you know, equivalent to this or can fill up a stadium to X amount of feet. So 
Customer awareness like that certainly helps pull through the jobs, and, and we deal with a lot of national food service chains uh, that's the same way. So by creating that awareness creates the jobs, and then we find just by marketing that from our, our, our website and, and uh, just letting uh, potential em employees know, it pulls a lot of people to us, and people will actually come to work for us uh, not so much for the money, but because they're really interested in making a difference in the environment. So it all goes hand in hand. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to throw the last question out. In, um, in this climate, the federal funding opportunities around green job training required unlikely bedfellows to partner together across silos, labor, business, policymakers, workforce providers, and I think the Blue-Green Alliance is actually an example of unlikely bedfellows coming together to work together towards a common vision. Um, so I'd like you to answer the question of how can labor, community, government, and business work more effectively together on these issues around building a sustainable green economy? Um, and well, I think what we've done in New York and I think is happening across the country is uh, <coughs> a, a big start where people are coming together to uh, build a consensus about what they have in, as a common interest. So <clears throat> in New York State at the Office of General Services mandating clean, green, clean cleaning products, mm -hmm. government working on that. Mm -hmm. The labor unions there learning how to use those. Right. Clean schools, retrofitting buildings, mm -hmm. doing that. Uh, that's in everybody's interest. You have to create that market. You can't expect the government's going to do it and if the market's not there. You've got you, you to gotta make sure that companies like yours uh, succeed. We have to have an investment in that. We have to in, uh, create the market for you to succeed, for the workers that you hire to be able to succeed, and you've got to create the market. That's where there's a role for government to do that. Mm -hmm. But that requires breaking down the barriers between environment, business, labor, and we've been doing that there, and a lot of people are doing it, academia. So mm -hmm. whatever you do, we have to take it to the level of the unions. We're involved in the transformation of the labor unions mm -hmm the consciousness of labor unions, working with IBW on solar energy, people realize it takes a little time, but you can do it, and you gotta not define each other as the enemy. You gotta be able to, like, talk about South Africa, somebody earlier, reconciliation. Doesn't mean everybody agrees, but they agree that people operate in the same environment and have common interests, and we won't agree on everything, but labor and management have learned how to do that through contract negotiations. We can do that. And I think government and environment can do that together. Mm -hmm. Other thoughts? Where's the common ground? How can we work together? Dr. Sure. Uh, I'd be happy to, to jump in. You know, Judith was talking about the fact that uh, you can't fish in the fresh water in the U.S. Uh, but we have lots of friends overseas in different universities. And you know, right now in Copenhagen, you can fish oh. in Copenhagen. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine that in the canals and waterways of Copenhagen? They turned it around that quickly. But it is because they were able to bring together major universities, government, and private industry. Now, I know it's not popular to look to the Europeans right now, but the Europeans do some things very well. They do. And one of these are these partnerships. What I've been impressed by is, though we don't say it's modeled on the Europeans, and I don't think we'd want to say that, uh, I'm very impressed by what the Obama administration is trying to do with these hubs and DOE, because we're different than a national lab, right? We're not inventing the super nuclear powered water heater in the basement, right? Or, or something like that. We're actually talking about the nexus of people, information, and technology. We're actually trying to bring together and create adjacencies between private industry, academia, and government to create adjacencies between theoretical people and practical people, to create adjacencies then across the the different spectrums that we see. And as you probably know, there are three other hubs, and there will be more of these. And I think it's just a, a really very interesting and different time that they've, they've uh, initiated this, and it's kind of exciting. Our hub in particular, you should know, uh, we can spend more time and effort on these, these things that we call people and information, and not just science and technology, because our hub is quote unquote an ERIC, which is an energy research Innovation Center, and a couple of my colleagues are back there, but I think this came out of the Brookings Institute. Is that right, Paul? The whole concept of the innovation cluster and so forth. And, and they picked up on it, married it together with some of the things, the eight or nine big problems that Steve Chu felt needed to be worked on from his perspective at Lawrence uh, Berkeley Laboratory. 
and they married the two. And we're the first test case for it. So we have to be successful. Not too much pressure, but we have to be successful. And we're really pushing ourselves really hard uh, to be successful and to do it in this region first and then to sort of use this approach elsewhere around the country. For buildings, yes, but for batteries and energy storage, you know, for wind power, smart grid, there are a whole host of these coming out. So as you watch for the science news, for those of you who read science news type things, mm -hmm. you'll see this coming out over the next uh, year or so. And believe it or not, Congress actually approved these, right? So in our case, for example, people from both sides of the aisle got behind it. How unusual is that? But, you know, it just, it's logical. And so you can only hope that, you know, we could start to bridge that cultural ideological divide with just common sense. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time, but I think that's a great closing comment that um, we're talking about something that has been actually a bipartisan effort that people, unlikely bedfellows, have come together to create an environment where projects like the Greater Philadelphia Innovation Cluster can, can be successful. Thanks so much, panelists, for joining us here today. Please join me in thanking you. It's a pleasure to meet you. That was wonderful.